Hi, I'm Samantha Bernadine. I am a teacher at the High School for Youth and Community Development, known as YCD High School, on the campus of Erasmus Hall. This is my seventh year, and today is the last day of classes, so I'm ending my seventh year. So Erasmus, uh, before it was a, broke it into five individual schools, uh, still has a reputation of being the Erasmus of the 80s and early 90s. Uh, however, each principal on campus has made it their mission to um, address and separate themselves from the uh, ideas that people had or the reputation that Erasmus had back then. So you see students that are coming from different communities, uh, different educational levels. Uh, each school is bringing a different spin uh, in regards to academia, um, different opportunities uh, to our students here. So back in the 80s and 90s, we're talking about New York City, uh, where its government was at or was failing. Um, the city was actually bankrupt. Um, you had a number of strikes. Uh, you, we were, we were in the crack epidemic, crack cocaine, but mostly the crack epidemic uh, that was hitting predominantly uh, black and Latino communities. Um, in, you know, you had a huge spark in gangs that was happening um, in the community. So coming to Erasmus, and I had family members who came to Erasmus. Um, you know, you, it, it was dangerous. Um, it was challenging. Um, I didn't go to Erasmus, so I can't say from firsthand experience. However, uh, I do remember many altercations between Erasmus students and Prospect Heights and Clara Barden students because we were basically meeting right at Prospect Park. <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was it was very interesting. Um, if you survived um, gun violence, if you survive not being um, killed due to gang related activities, if you survive not being um, stopped and frisked by police um, and you made it to your 18th birthday, it was like, give me my social security check now um, because I made it. Um, I was fortunate enough to have parents that believed in education and believed that the only way to succeed is to um, value your education. I was able to get out. so. I went to school in New Hampshire, um, but the mentality of my peers back then was if you got arrested and went to jail, that was more interesting than going to college. If children were exposed to opportunities outside of their 10 block radius, just imagine what they can do. And unfortunately, a lot of my peers was not given that opportunity. My mom, um, my parents was together, but my mom specifically, she went and searched for opportunities for my sister and I to be involved in so that we're never, you know, short of time. We're never, she, she knew that as black women, um, first generation Americans, that we were going to have everything against us. And her job was to make sure that we had enough arsenal in our belt that when we go out, we are prepared. And we're confident enough that if anything comes our way, we'll be able to handle it appropriately. All those experiences is the reason why I got into social service. So my mom was big on community, community engagement, parent advocacy. Um, later on, I learned that it wasn't because I got left back in school. She was an advocate when she was in Grenada. 
So I was like, okay, so it must be in the blood. <laughs> um, but here in America, uh, she didn't know the educational system. And when my fourth grade teacher left the entire class back, except for like seven kids, um, and the school was saying you should go, you should sign her up for special education. My mom didn't know exactly what that meant. And special education is much different than it is now, um, which is why I'm a special ed teacher. And because of her tenacity, she asked my former teachers, because she couldn't understand how this young girl was a student up to fourth grade what happened and uh, one of the teachers had told her if you sign up to special education you will be destroying her life and from there she wanted to know more about education she wanted to know how does education work in this country and she became a parent advocate. She became the PTA president for every school I went to. If there was a PTA association in college, she would have been one. <laughs> if I didn't, if I didn't travel as far as I did, she would have made one happen. Um, but she believed that you have to know who are the real players. And because of her work, she became the parent advocate for all the kids in the neighborhood which is why my friend said oh we knew you were going to go to college because she advocated for everybody teaching is my second career um i've done social service work for 16 16 and a half years uh, before making the switch to teaching but i felt that it was the next chapter of my life um because I'm bringing all of that work from my past life into this work. Teaching is not just, you know, assigning work, making sure that children know how to read at their grade level, giving them the necessary support in that particular subject. Teaching today is way beyond that. You are their aunt, their uncle, their big sister, sometimes their mother, you're their cook, you're their um, social worker, you're everything to them. The, a school building, if there's anything we learned from this pandemic, a school building is an extension of a student's home. Sometimes it's their home, period. We have students that are in foster care, that are in domestic violent relationships with their own intimate partner, um, in violent situation with their parents. Um, and this is a safe haven. And if anyone that is looking into getting into education and thinking that I just wanna teach history, you're not going to be able to connect to students. Um, they need, they need, they need adults that are going to listen to them talk about stranger things. So <laughs> I cook for my kids. Um, they always know I'm the snack person, but all of them, and when I say all of them, I mean the whole school. So I have staff members that's like, I know you got some snacks somewhere. Where are they? Could I get some? Um, I, I feel that cooking is a way of showing my love for them. Um, also that a lot of our students are, don't have the necessary support to feed themselves um, outside of getting a, a chopped cheese sandwich on the corner store. No shade or tea to them, but I'm like, you should eat something a little more comforting. Um, so, you know, due to the help of Flatbush Mixtape of helping us build our pantry, um, I'm able to make, you know, real homey foods that they sit and truly enjoy. I'm gonna say courageous. And I was battling between courageous and resilient. Um, and the reason why I say courageous is that the members of the Flappish community most of them are from the Caribbean diaspora. Um, 
and even with the changes that are happening you still see smell and taste the culture so even though buildings are being built um, they're being pushed out in my opinion from their neighborhood um, their fingerprint is still here and that they're still courageous to express their love for their native tongue, their native language, their native culture. Um, so I'll say courageous in that aspect. I would love for the redevelopment be for people who have been here, struggled here, lived here, shed blood and tears here, and as much as people will say, well, don't you want equality? It is not about equality, it's about fairness. Um, and I feel that black and brown people constantly have to struggle and fight and scrape and survive. And it's like, when do I just live? And why do I have to be pushed out of something that I helped build and I can't reap the rewards of that? Housing is everything. You know, and if you can't lay your head and rest, you can't do nothing. Everything gets affected. The quality of life just deteriorates. So as you see homes being built here and there is a homeless population still here, um, you can't say, well, we're bettering the community by what? No, I think, I think Right now in Flatbush, the housing market is one of the biggest concerns. Um, and I, I see it also in the eyes of my students, because we do have students that live in shelters, that travel as far as the Bronx to come to school. Um, you know, to have access to the, to, to have access to a bed that is comfortable enough that when they wake up and come to school, they're rested enough to even hear what I'm saying versus falling asleep in the stairway because they couldn't sleep because they're sharing a, a bed with their siblings. November, early November of 2020, uh, when my principal asked myself and a colleague to be part of a task force that the former mayor was conducting um, in reference to uh, the property on the corner of Bedford and Church Avenue and uncovering that that was an African burial ground <laughs> and that they wanted to put housing on top of our ancestors. So to learn that the city has that property all these years and knew exactly what that property was and to let it go the way they did and now want to put housing there, housing to, um, to alleviate the housing crisis in the neighborhood, it was like, are you for real? Um, I, I want the community of Flatbush to know that their history is so rich and yet, so hidden and that now is the time with this as we're coming out of this pandemic as we're still in even though we don't see the marches as much we don't see the protesting as much but the work of the black lives matter movement the social justice unrest um, that people were forced to see as well as encouraged to participate I don't want that to leave. I, I want us to continue to be sophisticated in our approach, that they know that this burial ground is attached to us in so many ways, and that when they pass by uh, the work of the Flatbush African Burial Ground Coalition and other members of the community come together and you know spread the word that this site is sacred land, we need to hold ourselves accountable in making sure that the city doesn't take advantage of that once again. That no one 
no outsider comes in and wants to whitewash the history um, of our contribution to this country and, contr and contribution to this city and this neighborhood.